Thank you so much for that uh, welcome and uh, that introduction. It's pretty much as I wrote it, really. And uh, I too want to acknowledge the uh, traditional owners of the land and uh, the custodians, elders and emerging leaders. Um, Ivan Illich, an activist and writer, was once asked, what's the most powerful way to change the world? Is it revolution? Do you work out who the great, powerful, wealthy are, pulling the levers and blackmail them, kidnap them, execute them, distribute their wealth? Is it revolution? Is it reformation? Do you put your people who have your values and vision in the commanding heights of politics and education, of economy, and start slowly to reform. They, with their vision and values in the key guardian institutions, bring on a reformation. Illich nodded and said, it's neither revolution nor is it reformation. If you want to change the world, you have to tell an alternative story. Well, it's nothing short of ironic and perhaps in equal measure disturbing that this month, as war, conflict and violence monopolise our daily news cycles, we mark the 40th anniversary of the United Nations International Day of Peace. We're living at a time when peacefulness, according to the Global Peace Index, has declined to its lowest level in 15 years, fueled by a combination of pandemic, economic uncertainty, the Ukraine conflict and global hunger. The doomsday clock is now at 100 seconds to midnight, which remains the closest the world has ever been to apocalypse since the clock's creation in 1947. Well, the alternative story was once the United Nations. When we think that right now economies are teetering, there's food insecurity, conflicts increasing, waves of refugees building, global inequality blowing out. Remember that in 1945, after a grim, a grim aftermath of that unparalleled catastrophe and barbarism of two world wars just 20 years apart, Wars that saw close to 80 million people killed. Massive refugee crisis, entire generations lost for all time, and amid towns and cities and countries utterly destroyed, the world came together around a story. Then it was the alternative story. The United Nations was founded, Australia one of its founding members, and that story said never again with war. It was seen as a turning point for progress. The people of the world committing to resolve their differences peacefully, to solve their problems together. Of course, the first uh, attempt, the League of Nations had failed, but the United Nations, a parliament of humankind, was a response to the carnage of war. The same year that the United Nations was born, the Nobel Prize Committee, wishing to show its support for the alternative story, the establishment of this new world organization, awarded the Peace Prize to Cordell Hull, a man known as the father of the United Nations. The UN's creation was a peace response, a response to end War. It was seen as the alternative story, a parliament of the world's peoples saying never again. And its vision went further than just preventing war. Echoes of this alternative story, which were quite novel, were universal declarations of human rights. Universal, the world buying into a different story. And that declaration asserted extraordinarily, all people have the right to freedom of peaceful assembly, of association and adequate standard of living. Its UN Charter promised a new world based on respect for the principle of equal rights, of self-determination of peoples. 
Then US President Truman delivering a speech to delegates at the newly born UN. He said, with this charter, the world can begin to look forward to the time when all human beings may be permitted to live decently as free people. He added, we must provide the machinery which will make future peace not only possible, but certain. Well, 77 years on from the birth of this alternative story, we realise the grand promises haven't been realised. Of course, uh, the counterfactual is, but what would the world be like? Would it be even worse if we hadn't even had the UN? That we don't know. But certainly the wars have continued. No apocalyptic nuclear war since the formation of the UN. But millions have died in conflicts. They roll off the tongue. Korea, Vietnam, Rwanda, Algeria, the Congo, Cambodia, Sudan, Angola, Iraq, Libya, and of course today, Ukraine. Millions living in refugee camps. 10 million displaced in Ukraine. 4 million women and children that have fled Ukraine to Romania and Poland. According to the World Bank, the number of people living in conflict areas has nearly doubled between 2007 and 2021. So then we say this alternative story, which was absolutely worth a try, seems to have failed, thanks mainly to a security council with five, the permanent five, China, France, Russia, UK and US, being superpowers allowing their rivalries to veto peace, to really strike at the heart of what the UN was created to do. And we know that this alternative story has been subverted by the actions of a few, particularly superpowers, and dissenting states allowing a roadblock to the common resolve of so many. Former Australian Foreign Minister Gareth Evans once said, no opera organisation in the world embodies as many dreams, yet delivers as many frustrations as the United Nations. Because we had such hope, it was an alternative story. Doug Hammerjold, the second uh, Secretary General of the UN said, well, the United Nations was not created in order to bring us to heaven but to save us from hell. And it may still be that without the United Nations, we would be in a worse hell, despite all its terrible imperfections. When we think about what unites people through human history, it really has been three things. Their God or gods, their family bloods and nation, blood and soil and flag-waving nationalism, or a common enemy. The UN, at least, is pointing the way in saying, can we unite around a common enemy? It's called climate change. It's called global pandemics. Can we reject blood and soil nationalism Keep your belief in God, gods or no God, but unite still against what threatens every human being. As the current UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, says, it takes a world to fix the world. Well, the dream of that alternative story we still have to keep alive, but find a way of telling it, perhaps with different mechanisms in different ways. Amartya Sen a Nobel-winning economist. He looked at peace through the lens of what he called ensuring everyone has the right to live the kind of lives they have a reason to value. That is still a very powerful storyline, isn't it? A diversified unity of purpose, the right to live the kind of lives they have the reason to to value another Nobel laureate, Martin Luther King, put it, true peace is not merely the absence of tension, it's the presence of justice. So here are the 
storylines that still have a chance if we can find the architecture around them, the right to live the kind of lives that you have the reason in you decide that reason why you value it, the presence of justice. For a time with the pandemic, there seemed to be a chance. We discovered an invisible virus profoundly showed the utter interdependence of humans on this planet. Whatever our nationalism, whatever our race or our sexuality, all the other stories we tell ourselves why we're superior to someone else. In Australia, we found we could, in the pandemic, house the homeless. In, Mel in Melbourne, the most locked down city in the world, the homeless actually were put in hotels. We found a way to say, actually, them being homeless threatens us and we want to get them vaccinated and, and housed. We found a way to actually increase job seeker. For a while, there was this sense of the alternative story and the apparatus that's needed starting to emerge. Well, there has sad, sadly been an evaporating of some of that story. And with Ukraine and that breakdown, we are seeing the ripple effects. I've been in Canberra the last two days lobbying uh, politicians from government, uh, including Penny Wong and also the opposition, saying if we can give $450 million, which I support in military weapons to Ukraine, we actually are also responsible for now the ripple effects of that embargo on Ukrainian wheat rippling through Africa. Somalia has just used the F word. The F word is famine. It takes a lot to declare a famine. Governments will declare all sorts of other categories, but not the F word because it's an admission of failure. It's very rare. The ripple effects through not just Somalia, but Ethiopia and Kenya. These ripple effects, and we're asking for just $150 million from the Australian government, getting pushed back. Well, no, we just look after the Indo-Pacific. Africa's too far away. Well, Ukraine's a long way away too, and they got our weapons. This story has to be inclusive because African women and their kids are starving now because of the knock-on of uh, the war in Ukraine. Well, my time is nearly up, but what I do want to say is when we can spend, as we do in Australia, $48 billion on defence, and I know the politics of Adelaide has something to do with defence spending. I'm not going there. However, when we can spend $48 billion in Australia on defence, but only $4 billion on aid, something's wrong. It's not the alternative story. When aid is at its lowest ever, 50 cents in $100 of uh, gross national product under Bob Menzies, 50 cents, aid was at its highest under a Liberal government. Now at 19 cents out of $100 of GDP in Australia. Scandinavian countries are at 80 cents, Britain at 60 cents, Dutch at 90 cents, we're at 19 cents, and we're in the region where most of the world's poor still live, but we're told no Africa. I was hearing it from both sides too far away. Well, the alternative story requires us to say universal dignity in my faith, the image of God in every person. When I'm encountering someone who's a human, I'm encountering something of God. Dignity. Doesn't matter where they live. Our charity doesn't end at the continental shelf of Australia. Let me uh, finish by saying that this alternative story has had many champions. Eleanor Roosevelt was a champion of the UN and I still am one who believes we have to fight to reform the UN. She said, where after all do universal human rights begin? In small places, she said, close to home. So close, so small, they cannot be seen on any maps of the world. Yet they are the world of the individual person, the neighbourhood they are in, the school or college they attend, the factory, farm or office where they work. I believe the alternative story 
And all the progress in the history of the world has been the story of human consciences at work. Human consciences collaborating together saying, what is right? What can I do? Who can I work with? Mother Teresa, I think, put it very well. She said, there's no us and no them. There's only us. If you want a definition of morality, it's about us, not me. We, not I. That's the simplest, most profound definition of morality I know. Kierkegaard put it this way, the door to happiness opens outwards. If you want to be happy, start serving and loving and giving and speaking up for others. And curiously, paradoxically, you also will be happy. Well, the global crises are big, but do start living the alternative story that comes from our conscience, that is the practice of our morality, that says doing this together as a world, naming the enemies of climate change and pandemic is the story. Let me finish with um, a true story of a friend of mine in World Vision. At uh, 24, he was in Africa. He was on the back of a truck. He was two hours out from the city, bouncing along at 10 kilometres an hour because African roads have potholes big enough to swallow trucks and they're terrible. Thick forest on either side and a massive tree had fallen across the road and they screeched to a halt. The bush was so thick you couldn't get around. Sitting on top was a lone African chipping away at this massive tree trunk with a tomahawk. Completely futile and useless. They tried to back up the truck, which they did many times, get out chains. They couldn't get the chains around the tree trunk. It was too big. Another truck came the other way. It stopped. They all got out. They all agreed the only opportunity, the only chance was to try and line up with shoulders and heave. Well, they did. My friend Dave, they heaved. It barely shuttered this tree trunk. Dave, first time in Africa, thought he was out in the bush, out in nowhere, but Africans just started appearing out of the bush. He said, I didn't know who they were. I didn't know where they came from or where they, they started appearing. They were enlisted, shoulders to the trunk. On three, they heaved. It shuddered. This tree wasn't moving. Someone said, well, it's two hours back. <laughs> one last time. We won't die wondering. As they put their shoulders one last time, Dave remembers this frail, elderly African man coming out and snuggling in with his shoulder next to Dave. He remembers him because he looked at him and he thought, fat lot of good you're going to be. This African man started to sing an African song. Dave didn't know it, the Africans did, and they were waiting. There was a crescendo coming. And when he got to that note, they all knew to heave. This massive tree trunk moved maybe a quarter of a centimetre. They took a breather, shoulders again. Man started singing again. Dave was ready this time. Got to a crescendo, they heaved. Dave said, we sang and heaved, sang and heaved 70, 80, 90 times. We lost count. Quarter of a centimetre, quarter, until they'd moved just enough for the truck to squeeze through and continue on in that direction. Dave later became the CEO of Boston Consulting. CEO based in Boston, he's American. He said that was the most significant lesson for my consulting ever. He said the mission never changed. The mission was to move this tree trunk. He said the strategy couldn't be tomahawk, couldn't be chains. The strategy never changed. It was just human, human strength. So what changed? What changed was a frail African man's song. It drew out something in us that wasn't there before, that got us into perfect alignment when we heaved. Well, the alternative story that we're looking for the song that we need is a song of free consciences that are committed to morality, that wants still to push with reform of the UN, but looks for machinery to say in these times, how do we overcome the conflict, the tribalism, the world profoundly retribalizing by lifting above to sing a song? 
that we all agree on for our future and our kids. Thank you.